Okay, recording. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I am Sajal Lanneman uh, from URI, College of the Environment and Life Sciences Cooperative Extension, and I'm the Community Engagement and Outreach Coordinator uh, for the college, and I'm really excited uh, to be here tonight and to listen all about insects, the good, the bad, and the mysterious. I think we all need a little bit of mysterious bugs in our life uh, where most of us are, are home and dying from boredom. So I think this is gonna be really great and really educational. We're really excited to have Melissa here tonight, uh, one of our awesome URI Master Gardeners. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about her in just a few minutes. Um, just gonna go over just a few housekeeping notes and tell you just a little bit more about cooperative extension. So Melissa, if you don't mind just advancing to the next slide. Uh, it's not letting me. Yeah, no worries. We're always, something's always stuck for a second. <laughs> All right, we've got lots of people here tonight. And this is going to be recorded, which we're really excited about. And we have this fabulous uh, Master Gardener team and they go in and do all the closed captioning so we can watch it with the sound off. Yeah, no worries, thank you. So Cooperative Extension, if you don't know, there's a Cooperative Extension associated with every land grant institution around the, the United States. And here in Rhode Island at URI, go Rams, uh, Cooperative Extension um, is attached since we are the land grant. Um, and basically, Cooperative Extension is charged with bringing science-based URI resources um, to the community. And we've been doing this since 1914. Um, so I think I think it's so easy to think uh, a lot of my my family and friends think I work with the college students, but actually cooperative extension works with we work in partnership with the students, but we bring our resources out to so many different stakeholders like farmers like gardeners folks that have wells and want to learn how to get that properly tested. So we we organize ourselves into these buckets our strategic area of focus. So those buckets are food systems and agriculture water resources, energy efficiency, conservation and renewables, and healthy lifestyles. If you have a second, visit us um, on our website and click any one of these pictures once you're on, on our site and all the different programs um, that will fall underneath all these, these different buckets. And we have so much out there if you wanna learn how to preserve food, or like I said, test that well, or you found a tick and you don't know what to do, or you don't know what kind of tick it is, we have something for everybody. All right, next slide, please. All right, and just a few housekeeping notes. So uh, the chat is disabled um, just because it gets a little confusing, but we do have the Q&A box uh, opened up. So if you have a question, you'll just want to enter it into that q and I'll try to answer some of them as we go along. Um, but if you ask a really good question that I can't answer, then we'll save that for our presenter right at the end. We might not get to all of our questions, um, but we will give you the information that you need to get your questions answered um, for today and for future questions because we have this fabulous gardening hotline. Um, following this uh, presentation, you're going to get an email with a really brief survey. And I'm telling you, what we do best at Cooperative Extension is we read all the surveys that you guys fill out and we change what we're doing based on your feedback. So please be honest. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, again, the session is going to be recorded and we have an awesome URI Cooperative Extension YouTube channel where you can find all of the recordings that we've been doing since the beginning of the pandemic. We have been hosting, we used to host them twice a week. And then once folks started going back to work, we went to once a week. So every Tuesday at seven, we have a webinar um, and it, it eventually landed right on our um, YouTube channel um, and it's also in closed captioning. Okay, next slide. Get my... So. All right, so now, yeah, now is where I'm going to introduce Melissa. So Melissa is a URI Master Gardener and she is from the class of 2011. Um, and she creates environmental programming for youth through the arts and community action. And her website and blog is at 15minutefieldtrips.blogspot.com. We are so excited to have Melissa. She spoke earlier um, in, in when we were offering the series, she gave us a talk on outdoor 
our classrooms. It was so well received. Um, if you love what you hear tonight and you want to learn more, you can always watch that recording and visit this website. She's got so many amazing things on there. And Melissa, tell us just a little bit more about what you do. And I know you're getting texts up the wazoo because people are expecting you to give your presentation on, on your website and you're not there. So tell us a little bit more about what we can find if we went to visit your website. And then the show is all yours. Okay. Uh, we do a lot of programming with schools, with parks. We do a monthly program at the Blackstone Park Conservancy, which is in Providence uh, between Parkside and River Road near the Seekonk River. And that's the second Saturday of the month now. So we just did a program this month on mushrooms. So people got to bring these really cool guides with them around the park and look for different kinds of mushrooms and fungus and learn how they act in the environment. Next month, November 14th, we'll be doing a program on trees. So you get to identify trees in the area and go on a fun leaf hunt with your family, do an art project, and also learn how trees help mitigate climate change. So trees can actually make an 18 degree difference just by having tree canopy in the area. And trees not only um, are nice to look at and help you relax, but they also produce oxygen, which is great for us. And it helps reduce asthma rates and the bark protects the tree and, and the, the Roots absorb water, but the roots are also going to reduce contaminants in the soil when we have flooding issues. They're going to help reduce erosion. So not only are you going to have a great time outdoors, you're also going to learn how trees are going to help us save our world. So check out the website and that will tell you a lot more. But we are here for insects today. So welcome to the good, the bad, and the mysterious. Here's a nice carpenter bee on some butterfly bush. So one of the good guys are the pollinators. Without pollinators, we wouldn't have one out of every three bites of food that we eat. So think about blueberries or almonds or apples. Like we, if you went apple picking this year, or if you got a pumpkin, you need pollinators to pollinate those. And particularly bumblebees are very important for a lot of our Northeastern plants because they've co-evolved to have the right size tongue to get into these tube-like flowers. So you think of, a, a pumpkin it has that very long flower and the bumblebees actually buzz in the key of A and it helps the pollen actually vibrate off and go onto their legs. So they're able to bring the pollen from plant to plant. And even plants that can um, grow without much pollination, they do they have better yields. Like if you don't have pollinators, you'll still get tomatoes, but you get a lot more tomatoes if you get those pollinators. So why do we meet, need bees besides pollinating our food? They do all kinds of, of things that we don't even realize that are important. They're helping create a lot of integrated relationships. And we think mostly of honeybees, but honeybees are actually an introduced species. So you get honeybees from uh, Europe and from Africa. And sometimes you can have, even have hybrids of those. And the only ones that actually make honey are honeybees and bumblebees because they live in groups. Most bees are actually solitary, but they still play a very important part in pollination and keeping the whole ecosystem going. So we'll learn more about these solitary bees. For instance, this is a male Hylaeus bee. I can tell it's male because it has a white face and has extra long antenna. It's the females that are gonna do more of the pollination because they actually collect pollen. The males are mostly uh, there for the nectar. And most bees are actually docile. People blame bees for stings, but it's usually hornets or wasps that are responsible for those. And it's only the females that actually have the stingers because it's part of their ovipositor or where they lay their eggs. And we'll look uh, at their special hairs that they've made that help them collect the pollen. All right, so pollination. We're going back to middle school, high school. Insect lands on a plant, gets the pollen all over its body, and then the fruit forms, and then the fruit ripens, and we get to eat it. Now, sometimes they don't get every little spot, and then you get those weird shaped fruit, but they're still delicious. But it's not just bees that pollinate. You also have certain kinds of flies, ants, wasps, and here, whoop. I'm in share mode. I was gonna blow up that picture for you. Here, if you look really closely, you can see the corpicula or scopa. Bumblebees actually have developed a little pocket to store all of the pollen. So if you see any bee with pollen on it, 
then you know it's a female because they, they are collecting those for their babies to put in with the nest. Who likes vanilla? I know I do. I know when I ask kids this, they all raise their hand. They love vanilla, especially when it's real vanilla and not the stuff made from petroleum. So vanilla is an orchid that is native to Mexico, and it is only pollinated by this tiny little bee called the Melipona bee. And it, this little guy doesn't even have a stinger. Now they brought these to Spain because they wanted to have vanilla there and they couldn't get any of these bean pods because the vanilla comes from a bean pod after it's been pollinated. And they couldn't figure it out. So then one of the uh, Spanish botanists went back and just watched the plant for a while and figured out that this little tiny bee was going all the way down this orchid lifting up a door at the base, getting the, the nectar and pollen and getting out. So now most of the vanilla that you buy today is actually grown in Indonesia and Madagascar, and they have to do this by hand. These flowers only last a day or two. So someone has to go out into the field every single day, look for the um, orchids that are just right, and then hand pollinate each one. So that's why your real vanilla costs so much. But these guys do it for free. So we should work with nature and figure out how, um, what kind of job they're doing and how we can all work together. And here's a close up of bumblebee. Look how long that tongue is. They have developed a special relationship with all of these plants, so they are the best pollinators. And you can see their tarsus or little toes. They've already got the job down pat. They've had millions of years of evolution to figure it all out. So we do like to have our honeybees because honey's delicious and it's antiviral and it has all good good kinds of health benefits, but all those native solitary bees are also important. This is just a quick view of their life cycle. So they are in the same family as uh, wasps and ants, Hymenoptera. So they start off as a tiny egg, and then they're going to grow and grow. You, you will almost will never see a baby bee because they're always in a nest. And with the honeybees, of course, they're in a hive, but with other solitary bees, we want to protect where they live. So there's actually over 4,000 species of bees in North America. And these are just a few, like you have your minor bees, your wool cotters, honeybees, bumblebees. We'll go over those in a little bit, but just look at the diversity. Some are fuzzy, some are flat and round, some are very large, some are thin, some are even green. All of these are important to the ecosystem. They all have their own specialties. So this is a carpenter bee. So you can tell by it's got a fuzzy thorax and a shiny abdomen. I believe this is a female Eastern carpenter bee. The males have a white face, but like all insects, they have a head, thorax, abdomen, and six legs. And they're from the Hymenoptera order because that means membrane wings. So you can see that very clearly on the wings. And most bees, uh, most insects have two pairs of wings, but with the bees, they are actually hooked together in the back. And then if you look closely at their face, you will see that they have three extra eyes there. That's actually helping them navigate. When people use insecticides or things to kill hornets, that actually is going to affect the bees navigation system. Here's another great thing they've evolved is these long hairs. So this is another way I know this is female because this is going to help them collect pollen because this is going to um, stick to all these hairs. And, oh, I wanted to see, oh, I forgot my question, hold on. All right, so I've already given you the answer, but can anyone guess what kind of plant this is? Maybe you didn't see the next slide, but it is a milkweed. So a lot of bees that are in the Apidae family, which includes honeybees and bumblebees, they love milkweed. And if you think of milkweed, you usually think of monarch butterflies, more on that later. But if you're wondering what a milkweed looks like, here's a way to identify it. It has opposite leaves. So that means you have one on each side, like symmetry, and they're usually covered in light fuzz. There are several species of milkweed, so they're not gonna all look exactly like this. This is the common milkweed you might see at the side of the road. If you broke off a piece, a milky sap would come out. That's actually latex-based, and that's, to try to keep animals from eating it because it gums them up. 
but you'll find later that there's a lot of insects that actually have no problem with that. Um, not all the flowers are pink, but many of them are, and they're usually in globules or globes. And then the seed forms into a pod, and you might have seen those floating around lately. They're great fun to, to open them up and let them fly away. And this, of course, is the host plant to monarchs. A lot of people plant these in their gardens because they want to help them. Because monarch populations are in decline, especially on the West Coast. But this is just a, a small sampling of other animals that interact with milkweed. You've got your, your bumblebees. You've got the monarch caterpillars here. Here's a milkweed bug nymph, monarch adults, oleander aphids. I had plenty of those this year. This is a milkweed uh, longhorn beetle. This is a swamp milkweed beetle. See, so they're both beetles. And then a weevil is a beetle with a snout. And look, it's just going after that, that sap. And all these have a different relationship. Like this one likes to eat the seeds. This one likes to eat the sap. This one likes to eat the leaves. And this one, this is the tussock mil milkweed tussock moth, and they're gregarious, which means they always congregate in a big group, and they'll just go to town and like completely skeletonize the leaf. Whereas the um, the monarchs are more subtle eaters. They actually have to shave off the hairs because they don't like to eat that part, and then they'll they'll chew the leaves. And they actually prefer the cultivated milkweed, Asclepia tuberosa, because it's easier to chew. So this one is just looking at the Apidae family. You've got your honeybees, your bumblebees, your carpenter bees. So we have Xylocopus, the large carpenter bee, Ceratina is the small carpenter bee, and then my one of my favorites, the longhorn bee. The males have very long antenna and they're super cute. But these uh, are actually being studied by um, one of the entomologists at UMass, Lynn Adler, and she's actually doing a study because a lot of people have noticed that the bees really like sunflowers, so she's going to see if any other um, bees like ones in the same family. So sunflowers also include daisies and asters like right here. Um, so you can look up her name, Lynn Adler, and she is doing a study on that. Also, if you go to, um, I have it here, um, greatsunflower.org. You can do a citizen science project. It's late in the year to do that now, but greatsunflower.org, you can actually um, take a um, plant sunflowers and just observe how many bees come to visit it. And then there's a Worcester project called um, Bee Ecology. I think it's called beecology.wpi.org. I'm sure if you Google it, you'll find it, but you can actually use their web app and videotape bumblebees, and it will help you identify what species it is and if it's male or female, and it'll help you with its most common plant. So they're doing, all three of these groups are doing studies to help protect the bees. So if you want to protect the bees and get more pollinators in your garden, it's important that they have food. So depending on what species of bee, they want to want certain food, but you want to stick mostly with natives. So some like um, shallow plants, some like tube-like flowers, but you want to have food from early spring to late fall. If you plant in clumps, that's a lot better than having just one singular species of a plant. So if you decide, okay, I'm going to do a bunch of milkweed, have a big clump of milkweed. Or if you want to do a bunch of aster, have a big clump of aster. If you want to look up what's going to work well in your yard, you can go to um, nationalwildlifefederation.org and it'll tell you what is native in your area and it'll help you out with like different um, sun requirements. Also, if you go to uh, Rhode Island Natural History Survey that, org, it'll give you like their top plants that they're trying to preserve. So Joe Pieweed is on there. So you want early spring. That also includes trees. There's a lot of trees that are important to, to early pollinators like willow or maples. They produce flowers. So having a willow early in, in the year is going to give some of that pollen to the pollinators as well. And then you want some for late fall. So that includes a lot of herbs, like you might have grown herbs in your garden, like some oregano or some borage. Let it go to flower. Let it um, feed a few bees. Like the bees love the oregano in my yard. They go nuts over it in the sage. It's one of their favorites. So let, let some of those plants flower. Get some mums. It's great season for mums right now. So we can't just feed them in the summer. They need food for most of the year. 
And now that it's winding down, then you're actually going to get a little bit lazy, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So here's just some spring flowers. We have dead nettle, phlox, and later in the spring, you get lavender. These are plants you might already have. Sunflowers we mentioned, and this is Anna's hyssop that's in the mint family. But bees love these, and they're very easy to grow. And then later we have uh, native and cultivated asters. This is uh, Canadian goldenrod, which actually does not give you allergies. It's blamed for allergies, but it's actually ragweed that gives people allergies. Ragweed is wind pollinated, and the goldenrod is insect pollinated. So the insects have to go to it to bring the pollen from place to place, so it's not airborne. And this is a locust borer beetle, another longhorn beetle. And then we get a little bumblebee on the oregano. So here's where you need to get lazy. You actually got to leave stuff lying around for the bees and other animals to hibernate in. Some bumblebees actually hibernate um, underground under leaf litter. So when you're raking up, leave some for the bees. And if you're having an insect problem, you might want to like get rid of some of the mulch and, and leaves in that area if you feel like they're overwintering it in your leaf mulch. But other than that, if you have like a spare area where you know that they can hang out, try to leave some leaves for there. Frogs and toads hibernate in there, salamanders. So you're doing a great thing by being lazy. I won't judge. Uh, another thing you do is if you grow any cane fruits like blackberries or raspberries, you want to cut the canes and leave about six inches of, of the cane because there's some bees that will actually uh, lay eggs in those canes for the next year. They might lay like 10 to 20 eggs in there. So you leave them for there and then in the spring you will get more baby bees. So that's some of the shelters that they want. So think about your yard. Everyone wants a pristine garden where everything's perfect, but actually you need some spaces like bare soil, like, oh, I can't have just bare soil in my yard, but that's perfect for minor bees. Uh, there was a class in, in Oregon that renamed them the tickle bees because their baseball field was, was full of them and people were afraid of the bees because, oh no, everywhere I walk is bees, but these are very gentle bees and they're important pollinators. Uh, the fruiting canes we just talked about. You can also put up a bee house. Uh, I'll show you how to do that with Phragmites or the common reed. The Australian common reed is actually very invasive, but you can turn it into a bee house. And leaf snags, which are dead trees for bees. As long as it's not in danger of falling on anyone, it's great habitat for owls, for bees, for woodpeckers. So again, be lazy, you'll help nature out. Uh, brief description of colony collapse disorder, which is affecting uh, bee colonies nationwide, particularly the honeybees. Basically, when um, Bees have to eat only one kind of food, like a monoculture. They're brought to, say, an almond orchard, and they have to pollinate only almonds. How would you feel if you only ate one kind of food? Would you be very health healthy? And also, these bees are shipped from place to place, so they might do an almond field in California and then go cross-country and do another kind of crop in another country or another county. And they're going to be tired because they've traveled a lot. They're going to be introduced to new diseases. Uh, they get this kind of virus from the varroa mite, which is everywhere. And one thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to, to plant more um, native plants, even quote unquote weeds around the bases of, of almond trees. They're starting to plant mustards so that they get a little bit more nutrition. Uh, Paul Stamets, who's really, uh, he was a logger and now he's a mycologist. He's been studying how um, certain funguses are helping the bees, like he's actually seen his own bees go to this fungus and inoculate themselves. So paying attention to what's gonna help, help them and try to keep things local as much as you can. Because when you have these insects that are, are working for us and you bring them to all different places and they get exposed to different diseases, they get moved around a lot, they're tired, and then someone goes and sprays the whole field, that's gonna all contribute to this colony collapse disorder where entire hive can be lost. Some of it is because they're dying out. Sometimes they get their um, navigation system messed with and they can't find their way around. So again, to protect the bees, you want to plant native flowers, go for different shapes. If they're all two flowers, you're only going to get one kind of bee. 
to try to get different shapes, plant early spring to late fall. Don't use toxic chemicals. Leave leaf litter. Even ornamental grasses. There's some bees that actually hibernate in tall grasses and they look really pretty in the winter and leave a few of those canes. So here we go. The invasive Phragmites, you can see it's much larger than the native Phragmites and it'll completely outcompete and like push out all the native plants, but they're hollow inside. So you can actually chop them up and turn them into a bee house. So honeybees aren't gonna live there, but mason bees will. And this is a very easy project you could do with your family, with a kid even. My, my daughter and I made a couple of these. You want to keep it closed at the top, though. We put little roofs on ours. If you leave that open, water is going to get in there. Another way to make bee houses is to drill holes in wood, and you want to do different sizes because there are different size bees. Like a mason bee is much smaller than a carpenter bee. So here's Mega Kilidae. So that's your leaf cutter bee, your orchard bee, your mason bee, and your carter bee. So these are the ones that are going to live in those kind of structures. And they have different ways of building because the mason bee actually uses um, its own spit and mud to build, just like a mason would. Wool carter bee, they'll actually, uh, if you have any kind of fuzzy leaf plant, like a rose campion or um, a lamb's ear, they actually um, shave off the fur on the leaf, and then they use that as a little pillow, and then they'll make a pollen cake and lay an egg with it. So then that's what they're putting in those tubes. They're doing like fuzzy pillow, pollen cake, egg, fuzzy pillow, pollen cake, egg. And Adrena Day, those are your minor bees. Those are the ones that are living under the ground. So leave some bare spots for the bees. If you do go to greatsunflower.org, they have some great tips to make your yard more bee friendly. Here's Kalita Day. And sweat bees are pretty cool because they come in lots of amazing colors, mostly greens. So this is just a few of the sweat bees. Now, those are all good guys, but we also have some bad guy bees. This is a cuckoo bee. So cuckoo bee is not a specific genus. Like each genus or genera has its own kind of cuckoo bee. And a cuckoo bee is basically a bee that is a moocher. It doesn't contribute. You can see this bee does not have fuzzy legs because it's not there to collect pollen. It's not here to help anyone out. It's just there to get a quick snack and take off. Some of these actually chew through the sides of flowers, destroying the flower just to get to the nectar. And you can tell that they're usually red or reddish. Uh, this one's male, long antennas, but if you see any kind of bee that it looks really thin with no fuzz, it might be a cuckoo bee. And it's not just bees again. We, even wasps will help pollinate flies, like um, pawpaws we grow in Rhode Island. They're actually pollinated by flies. And even ants will help pollinate. Here is a big headed ant on one of my peonies. So these, these pictures are almost entirely from my yard, just to let you know. So if you avoid the use of pesticides, like all these words you can't pronounce, most of these are banned in Europe and they're banned for a reason. There's a lot of other ways that you can protect your plants. You can companion plant, so you can have things that don't smell good to other insects that keep them away. You can use row covers or physical barriers to keep them from getting to the plant, or you can have other insects kick their butt. If you do have to use a, a product, make sure you follow the directions exactly and only use as much as you need. So now we're gonna have a little quiz. Are these friends or foe? Well, first you have to figure out what you have in your yard. My favorite site is called bugguide.net. It's a great way to um, figure out what you have. It goes by shape first, color last. So if you saw something like this, this is on my tansy. What the heck is that? And then this thing, what is that? I mean, grasshopper obviously, but is that a good guy or a bad guy? Let's find out. All right, if you saw this in your yard, would you panic? This is actually a best beetle. People even keep them as pets. Its job is to eat decaying wood. So most of the time when you find a big giant beetle, it's either hunting other beetles or it's eating wood. And these guys actually have to eat fungus as well. 
to be able to break down the lignin in trees. Lignin is what helps trees get tall. And it wasn't until um, fungus appeared that trees were actually able to break down. Before we had mushrooms to break them down, trees would just fall over and become peat. So these, the fungus and the beetles are very important for recycling our forests and bringing them back into soil so that more plants can grow. So these are good guys. All right, what if you saw this guy? Kind of looks like he belongs in my garden, but this is actually a robber bee, which is not a bee, it's a fly. Look at the, the eyes. They're very large and close together. The antennas are between the eyes, not on top of the head. So this is a kind of like a horse fly, and it actually captures bees and eats them, kind of like those, um, those killer bees we heard about on the West Coast. Their job is to eat bees. Now, everything needs to be balanced, so something's going to eat something, but... We want to keep a balance. This one's also not a bee. This is a bee fly, but this one's totally harmless. It just wants some nectar. It's just hanging out. It's not going to hurt you. Uh, sometimes the larva can be parasites of other insects, which depending on the insect might be a good or bad thing. But again, look at the large eyes at the top. All right, the locust borer beetle. Very, very attractive beetle. I love finding these but they do like to eat locust trees. So I would plant as much goldenrod as you can because that's a great fall, foli uh, fall blooming plant for insects. But if you have a lot of locust trees in your area, maybe not. Um, sometimes people confuse it with the Asian longhorn beetle. They are both longhorn beetles, but look very different. This one's black with white spots. And then sometimes it's just fi fun to figure out what you have in your yard. Just make a scavenger hunt of it. Like I found this colorful insect here. I found this one chewing on a leaf. I found this little bit of bubbles there. All of this is evidence of, this is a leaf bug. So true bugs have um, sucking mouth parts. And I was able to get that one down to species. This spittle bug is another kind of um, true bug. You could get that down to genus. And then a weevil. Weevil is just a beetle with a long snout. I couldn't figure out what exactly, what kind of weevil this was. It looks like the same one that's on the milkweed, but it might be different. This is on oregano. All right, are you attracting the wrong crowd when you plant these things? You might be um, planting milkweed for monarchs, but you might get other things that you didn't bargain for, like this um, milkweed longhorn beetle or a borer beetle because it likes to bore holes in the stem. So here's that slide we saw earlier. So most of the time I, I'll get a few monarchs and then I'll get a few of these guys and I'll get a few of these guys. Once I got these um, milkweed tussock moss. But then this year I actually got almost entirely nothing but aphids. So. I did get a lot of ladybugs, mostly the Asian kind, and they went to town on these. But I had so many aphids this year, I'm actually gonna take a break from the milkweed next year just because I'm not attracting it enough of the insects I do want. I even got two different kinds of milkweed bugs. I got the large and the small milkweed bug. Made for great photographs, I got all their life cycles. I actually have a presentation just on milkweed, but Considering how many of these yellow aphids I got this year, I'm going to take a break from this plant. So this is what you're attracting. If you have very large leaves, you're going to attract grasshoppers because they're like, oh, it's an all you can eat buffet. But you can also attract mantids because they have a good place to hide. If you have a tall, stocky plant like rhubarb or sunflowers, you might end up with an aphid trap because ants will actually herd aphids like cattle. And as the aphids are sucking the juice out of the plant, they secrete something called honeydew. And the ants actually collect that honeydew and they protect their herd of aphids from the ladybugs. If you want to keep bugs away, a lot of flies and beetles are deterred from strong smelling plants. So think herbs. If you plant herbs around everything, it's going to help with your plant, like having basil near tomatoes. Um, sometimes um, rodents don't like the smell of mint. And sometimes flies don't like the smell of onion. So those are things that you can tuck in places here and there. Um, mulch attracts animals that overwinter it in it. So seed bugs can sometimes be a problem for my strawberries. 
And then this pill bug, I blame this pill bug for eating my strawberries. I was like, pill bugs, I thought you were my friends. What's going on? But I actually found out that what was happening was happening at night. Slugs were actually coming in and eating the strawberries. And the pill bug was like, oh, I'll clean that up. So the pill bugs are actually pretty cool because they are just cleaning up the mess. Now, if you saw this guy, would you panic? This is actually a baby ladybug or ladybug larva. So you want to have these around because they eat a lot of pests. And aphids do come in different colors. These are gray aphids that I found on some kale in a school garden. And they're pretty tiny, but they can take over. So ladybugs are going to eat all kinds of soft-bodied insects, so scale insects, aphids. And one thing that I find really attracts the, the ladybugs is tansy, which is a European plant. And I'm not sure why they get attracted to it, other than I always have aphids on it somewhere. So maybe it's the aphids that attract them and not the tansy in particular. But I've never had a year go by where I did not find ladybugs on the tansy. Tansy does get very large, though, so make sure you have a space for it if you're going to do that. And here's some on some German chamomile. And you can see there's many varieties. I don't know off the top of my head, but I think there's at least 600 kinds of of ladybugs. But just because they're pretty doesn't mean that they're all good guys. This one is a lily leaf beetle, a super pretty beetle, unless you saw its babies. Its babies are um, will eat your Asian lilies to the ground. What they do is they lay eggs at the base of your plant and the eggs hatch and then the larva feasts on the plant from the ground up and they cover themselves with their own waste in order to not get eaten. So you have to have to go out there and physically remove them I'll touch any kind of bug except this one. I always put on gloves when I have to handle these because they're just that disgusting. So this, if you do grow Asian lilies, I try to grow, grow mostly native plants, but my Asian lilies are just one of my, my little special plants. I do have to go out there and just check for these guys. Some years are better than others. This past year wasn't so bad. Uh, you I actually released a parasitic wasp that's helping uh, bring the population down. And then if you have a caterpillar, is it a good one or a bad one? I mean, there's four caterpillars here. Which one would make you panic? So we got our monarch butterfly. That's cool. Swallowtail butterfly, again, cool. They, the swallowtail butterfly likes things in the carrot family. So that includes like dill, lovage, parsley. This one just happened to be on a squash plant, but it wasn't eating it. It was just kind of getting from one place to another. Uh, winter moth, that's a bad guy. This year was not too bad for winter moth, but they can um, defoliate quite a few plants. And then tomato hornworm, of course, those will eat your tomato plants. But this one has actually been infected by another insect. A parasitic wasp has laid eggs all over this caterpillar. And when those eggs ha hatch, they're actually going to eat this caterpillar alive. So insects doing our work for us again. And this one is an ignumen wasp. This is another kind of parasitic wasp. And this is on a tulip, so you can see pretty tiny, but this is a good guy wasp. It'll actually keep populations in check. And this is from a year when we had really bad winter moth. So you can see they're very hard to see. This is on my weeping cherry tree. Very camouflage, but chewing the heck out of my leaves. Like I said, it was a very bad year. I ended up pulling up off by the handful and feeding them to my chickens. But if you look right here, there's an assassin bug here. So we think of most bugs sucking the juice out of our plant as bad guys, but this one is actually a good guy. And interesting fact, um, most of the assassin bugs or bad guy, uh, ones, most of the ones that um, eat the bad guys, they actually do it when they're immature. So this is an assassin bug juvenile, and once it becomes an adult, sometimes they change their behavior. Like I will show you a uh, Neuropta, a uh, lacewing later. The lacewings pretty much only eat nectar, but the juvenile will eat the scale bugs and the uh, aphids. So sometimes you're out in the garden, you're like, who done it? So you gotta keep checking. It could be under the leaf. It could only come out at night. So what do you think might have eaten this leaf?
This is my blueberry bush. Oh, I think I found it. These are my maple tree. Do you guys recognize this from a few years ago? The gypsy moth. So they also go through instars or changes between um, changing their exoskeleton. So when they get fully mature, they're going to have red spots and blue spots, but the earlier instars are not going to have the blue. So sometimes it's a little hard to identify, but they're very hairy caterpillar. They sometimes get confused with the Eastern tent caterpillar, which is native. The gypsy moth is actually from um, Asia and Europe. And even their pupa is hairy. So sometimes you find these in the leaf litter. So look for evidence. You'll have chewed leaves. When we have really bad years, you can actually hear them chewing in the trees. And you'll have their frass raining down on you. Uh, their favorite trees are aspen, maple, and oak. And I have maple and oak in my yard. So that bad year, it was pretty bad. Uh, they will, oh, the legs will be, oh, if the leg, sorry, if the, Eggs are laid in late summer or early fall, they will overwinter. But if they're laid in, in late spring, they will actually pupate within um, 10 to 14 days. You can kind of tell um, the males from the females. The, the um, males are actually smaller, but they have very large antenna to help them track the female, and the female is flightless. Uh, once they're actually in their last instar as a caterpillar, they'll have five pairs of red spots in the front and six pairs of blue spots in the back. And they do tend to congregate. And here are the adults. So those large white ones are actually flightless. Those are the females. That's the egg cluster and the males are down there and you can see the very large antenna right there. But if you go around trees, I didn't find too many this year, but some years I was finding them on the trees and I was just taking a plastic spoon and just scraping off the eggs. That's one way you can get rid of this one. But not all moths are bad. This is a leopard moth, very pretty, causes no harm, just lives off of trees like the caterpillars eat the leaves, but they're not devastating. They'll just eat a little bit and not cause much harm. And this one's one of my favorites. These are fun to raise if you're into that. This is a Cecropia moth caterpillar. And once they get to their last in star, they get the blue and the red, and they're spiky, and they're a lot of fun. And then they turn into these beautiful moths, which are in decline. So it's a great um, project if you want to raise caterpillars at home. With moths, though, they do take a lot longer. So you actually have to keep these over winter until the spring. It's not like butterflies where you have the, the pupa or chrysalis for a few weeks. You actually have to keep these over winter. So a little more time commitment there. Here's our monarch, of course. This one's male. You can tell by the little spots right there. And this is what the milkweed tussock moth turns into. So if you do want to get more into moss, there's a lot of uh, host plants that you probably already have in your yard, like the red maple, the pin cherry, different kinds of birch, Norway maple, which is an invasive plant, but it does provide a lot of um, habitat and shade. And I mean, all of these are native to our area. The shagbark hickory, the black walnut, the apple, apple trees, pussy willow elm. And a lot of these are gonna provide habitat and shade and all kinds of other benefits as well. So plant some trees. Sassafras is great for these, but it's also good for the, um, the uh, spice bush swallowtail. So the spice bush swallowtail only has two host plants, the sassafras, and the spice bush. If you want other types of host plants for butterflies, these are just a few like um, milkweed for monarchs, carrot family for swallowtail, mulberry for silkworm, pawpaw for the zebra swallowtail, and as well as all these plants like borage, grasses, lupins, and each of these will be associated with different species of butterflies or moths. Um, sometimes they're endangered because they're losing their host plant. So um, the Baltimore checker spot, its primary host plant was called turtle head, but where the turtle head weed is in decline. So it actually switched to plantain. So it's, it's doing much better with the plantain because that's more available for it. Uh, if you go to nationalwildlifefederation.org again, you can also find what particular plants you would like to plant just for butterflies. So they have one just for regular 
backyard native plants, and they have a list specifically for butterflies. All right, again, do I hit the panic button? There's a big hole in this thing. What could it have been? I actually called the Department of Environmental Management when I saw this because I panicked because I thought it was the Asian longhorn beetle. But the Asian longhorn beetle does not care about pine trees, and this was a pine tree, which means it was actually the pine sawyer beetle, also called the white spotted sawyer. So there's no need to panic because this little guy is native and it only goes after dead and dying pine trees. So it's actually helping recycle and break down wood. And this is one that came to visit me in my yard. Pretty impress impressive um, antennas there. Here's our life cycle of the monarch. So if you do decide to grow them, the, mon uh, the milkweed, this is what you look for, little yellow eggs. Then they gotta actually shave that hair off. Then they go through several instars and then the chrysalis and of course the adult. I like to use a giant pretzel container to raise them because they got lots of space. And some close-ups. And there's more on the tussock moth. You can see that they just congregate and eat the whole plant. So when you plant one thing, you never know what you're gonna get. But I promised you mysterious. So these are the guys that come out at night. There's lots of nectar here, and moths come about most moths come out at night. So these guys are actually coming out. This is the banded tussock moth. It's just coming out here for a drink. The caterpillars actually have a different host plant, so these guys only want the nectar. They're just coming to visit. So if you're into that, you could put a headlamp on, see what comes to visit at night. And then this one I found, this is a um, lacewing or neuroptera, and the juvenile will actually eat these aphids, but this one was an adult. So at this point, it's probably just eating the honeydew off of the aphids because their mouth parts change once they reach adulthood. Ones that will help you out though, we have the ladybugs helping out with the aphids. We have that assassin bug here. And of course, dragonflies. Dragonflies eat all kinds of insects, especially flying insects, including mosquitoes. And then plant for just enjoyment. This is our native Leas Leatris or blazing star. And here's a little skipper butterfly that just loves the flowers. So the more types of flowers you're gonna plant, the more wildlife you're gonna get. Butterflies especially like flowers that have wide open or umbral tops. This one's a round top, but like think of yarrow or Queen Anne's lace. They actually taste with their feet, so they don't need something that they can land on, and they can only fly if they're warm enough. And my daughter at least likes finding the grasshopper, so does my cat. But you never know what kind of discoveries you'll make, like this harlequin bug or dragonflies. We saw some of these true bugs earlier, which includes aphids. But then again, some of these are good guys. Like this, this is an assassin bug nymph. It's going to eat these guys. The ants might help pollinate, but right now they're creating havoc by having all these aphids gathered up. And pollination is done not just by bees, but by flies and wasps and other animals. And even this guy, like, oh, ladybug? Actually, it's a pleasing fungus beetle. They like to eat different kinds of mushrooms, mostly on rotting logs. So if you look under a log, you might find one, along with some other friends. And if you're lucky, you'll even find a cicada. It's actually a really um, good year for cicada killers. People think, oh no, cicada killers, because they're scary. But really, um, you're not even going to see the female cicada who a killer who has the stinger because she's mostly underground laying eggs. And what you mostly see are the males just buzzing around saying, get off my lawn, because they're just bringing her food. They'll catch the, the cicadas, bring them down underneath the ground for the female. And they're only around for a few weeks. We had a camp um, in a field full of them. Once the kids understood what they were, they were fine with them. They even wanted to catch them. So 
Cicada killers help keep populations in check because as cute as these cicadas are, they do um, weaken trees. We had a lot of weak weakening of the trees between the gypsy moss and the winter moss and then now this drought. So really we don't need the cicadas this year. And some more weirdos or mysterious ones. This is a squash vine borer moth. So it doesn't quite look like a moth, but it is. And this one's a bad guy because the larva will bore through your squash plants and all your cube cubits. But then we have this weirdo guy. This is called a mantis fly. And it's actually related to the lace wings. It's not a fly or a mantis. It's a neuroptera. And that means nerve wing. So look at the wings there. So this one's also a predator of other insects. Click beetles, those are fun. My daughter found that at the zoo. And they also eat uh, roots and stuff. But again, it's all about balance of populations. If you don't have too many, they're not a big deal. And sometimes people freak out of June bugs because they're super clumsy and they fly into you. I haven't seen one this year, but once, every once in a while, I just see them everywhere. And that is an acorn weevil. So if you go out and find acorns, we're having a mass year. You might've noticed acorns are everywhere. See if you can find a tiny pin size hole because this little guy came out of, of it. And you never know what you're gonna find. Like one time I found a centipede exoskeleton. I, good thing I took a picture because it rained the next day and it was gone. So get outside, make some discoveries and try to keep it all in balance. These are just a few of the resources I used. So definitely bugguide.net, you wanna check that one out. And then these are just some of the other ones I did research with. All right, how'd I do? I tried to keep under time. Oh my God, I mean, so fascinating. And I think I'm secretly in love with like a lot of the weirdos, like that leopard moth, like that could be the next biggest stuffed animal. That thing was adorable. Yeah, and the caterpillar's cute too. It looks like a woolly bear with red and black stripes. Oh, I just love it. I, I totally got uh, just trans, I just got fixated on, and on, on everything. I think you did fabulous and it's just such an amazing world. And I love, I love gardening. I love bugs because you just can't ever learn it all. There's so much to learn and it is just so incredibly important, right? To like know what it is that we're looking at and what we're finding so that we're not getting rid of these good guys. Because like you said, so many of these, you, you think it's something that's not good, but most of the time they really can be good. So I'm so glad that we have our master gardeners, people like you, we have our hotline. So if folks cannot figure out what insect they're looking at, take a picture, send it to us, and we will help you figure out what you have going on before you reach for any type of spray bottle. Um, they are just such fascinating creatures. Thank you so much, Melissa. We got so much great feedback and a lot of questions. So I think if you don't mind, I'm going to jump right in and just ask you a few. Okay. okay. Some really good ones. Some of them I'm not positive. I understand what they were asking, but I bet you will. Okay. So the first one is what are bees doing in the fall and flowers since they pollinate in the spring? Oh, they pollinate all like three seasons. Some of them even in, in the winter, if it's warm enough, they'll come out. So why it's so important just to have something blooming at all times in your garden, right? Like exactly. think, think three seasons at least. Okay. So question on carpenter bees, uh, carpenter bees drill into my deck to lay eggs. How are they not pests? Well, it can be quite a pain to have them drilling into your house. <laughs> my house actually has aluminum siding, so it's not a problem. They, they actually like to, um, drill into my raised beds and I don't have a problem with that. So one thing you could try is to give them a better habitat. So if you create a bee box, just those logs with the holes drilled in it, they might decide they want that better because they don't want to be drilling into something like you probably have pressure treated lumber. That's not great mm -hmm. for them either. So if you put something out there that they're going to prefer to have, they might move over to there. Makes sense. Um, let's see. So question on milkweed. Is giant milkweed an undesirable invasive? I don't know what giant milkweed is. I didn't, I, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't quite, I was only, I'm only familiar with milkweed. Yeah. 
because the one I showed you was common milkweed. There's also um, swamp milkweed is is pretty common here, and we also have our cultivated Escalpia tuberosa, which is the very, very short plant, but it's easier to chew. So if you want to attract monarchs, you're actually better off with that plant because it's less recognizable to all the other insects I showed you mm -hmm. that's associated with the milkweed. I'd have to like look into giant milkweed. It might be a, a different variety that's not native. I'm guessing. Um, what about bees and oak trees? Uh, do oak trees support bees? They do, especially if they have hollows, because certain bees will live in the hollows, particularly like um, mason bees look for hollows. Um, honey, wild honey bees will look for hollows and set up an actual colony in there. Awesome. That's they live in the wild. Um, so I did provide one resource, but um, when you were talking about the pollinator hotels and the bee hotels, um, if you are going to kind of makeshift your own and your drilling holes, what sizes are best? Ah, um, you want all different kinds, but three eighths and one quarter are definitely key. In fact, if you um, go to my YouTube channel, 15 minute field tricks, I have a video on how to make a bug house. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that you have a YouTube channel. We will uh, we will connect to that from ours. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, let's see. So, um, why were aphids so bad this year for some people? I'm trying to figure that out. I know the droughts helped because other insects didn't get a good start, and I think I just lost some of. Them. I didn't grow other plants that would have gotten good cover. Like I didn't grow many big leafy plants, so I didn't see many praying mantis this year. So I'm not quite sure why the aphids were so bad this year. Yeah, yeah, my, my in-laws, uh, we, we all grow nasturtiums. We love nasturtium flowers and they were infested heavily with aphids this year, but That's right. good thing for the ladybugs. Uh, yeah. were, they, were they black aphids on the nasturtium? Yes. Yeah, because they're actually a trap plant. I know, but what are you going to do? You love the nasturtiums, I guess. I <laughs> we make nasturtium butter. We put nasturtium on pasta. Like we eat nasturtiums and we didn't have the problem. They had the problem. But so yeah. aphids, aphids, were, it was a tricky year. Um, so woolly caterpillars, I'm trying to read my awful handwriting, um, that this person has on their ironweed. Um, any suggestions? I don't know if that maybe was just a statement versus a question. Like woolly bear or are they just fuzzy? I've that, noticed some caterpillars on my ironweed. It could have just been like hanging out. Okay. Like, um, okay, and there was clarification. I think the when we were talking about the giant milkweed, um, person actually just chimed in and said uh her bad she was accidentally um mixing it up with giant hogweed oh uh, okay so yeah. that's that's what that was about okay that's, a, that's in the carrot family any suggestions on how how to get rid of fig beetles i haven't grown fig um sometimes it's just a question of interrupting the life cycle like with the, the cabbage moth they come out really early because they actually have like an antifreeze in their blood. So the one of the first ones to come out. So if you just even plant your cabbage two weeks later or use like row covers, that'll help with the fig plant. I don't know if you can put some kind of netting over it. Right. I've never grown right. figs. Right. So if that wasn't uh, a, enough of an answer for you, you just email us on the hotline and we can get um, even some of our experts like Heather Fobert to uh, weigh in on that. But I think I think you're right. Let's see. So uh, boar bees, uh, are they good for the garden, but bad for furniture? Boar bees, you mean like carpenter bees? I would assume so. That's just how it came in. OK, um, the ones that are going to chew into your wood would be the carpenter bees. Yeah. And generally, they, they're going to look for something that's soft and not full of pesticide. So again, just give them some other option. Right. I've right. never heard of them being furniture. I don't know if you have outdoor furniture. Maybe you have tasty furniture. <laughs> you have a critique. I don't know. 
Try the hot pepper spray. Um, let's see. Um, so this person uh, is used to seeing lots of monarch butterflies every year, but they seem to uh, disappear abruptly. I rarely see the chrysalis. Is something eating them? Probably birds. Mm hmm. That's why I, when I see them, I actually keep them inside and I keep them inside. <laughs> Um, okay, just a few more that are coming in right now. I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, let's see. Uh, any tips on, uh, let's see, bugs that ate all the squash plants this year? What's the best uh, way to keep those bugs away? So, um, protective covers, planting later, um, having the um, actual, like, a lot of um, predatory wasps are good for that. They will attack the other insects. Uh, insecticidal soap, you can actually make that with a dog detergent spray bottle and just cut. They, they don't like it. They can't go on it. Um, if you're getting something like a, like a cutworm, you can grind up some eggshells in your blender and put it on the base of the plant so that when they try to go over it, it hurts them or use some diatomaceous earth. Yup, or train your children. <laughs> Go out there with your fingers. <laughs> yeah, or just in cooking. So it really depends. There's so many things that like squash plants, so it's hard to narrow down. Like, oh, I oh, know. Exactly he's going after your squash plants. I know. Sometimes like, I'll just put my hands up and I walk away. <laughs> just, yeah. They beat me. Then, like, you don't, they could be doing it at night. So, like, physical barriers could be row covers. It could also be, like, chopped up eggshells or diatomaceous or yeah yeah and 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 you're you're really on to something sometimes we find that just by starting some of our plants just a little bit later cucumbers for example we start them just a few weeks later than when everybody else is we tend to have less problems um and you just can't give up you got to keep seeding keep keep doing it and keep keep trying to get out there and and keep a visual i think you know, I work with farmers so closely and I realize just just how tough that 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 life can be. Um, but for those of us that are growing on a smaller scale, we have a little bit more control to get out there and, and use our hands and use our eyes and try to try to get on top of it. Um, let's see. I'll just wrap it up I, I, again. If we didn't answer your questions, I'm going to give you a plug for our hotline and we will get them answered. I promise. Um, let's see. Last question. Uh, can the lily leaf beetle completely defoliate the entire stem of leaves or is it some other animal? It's a lily leaf beetle. Yeah. They will eat it to the ground. They're horrible. They really are horrible. This is coming from someone that loves bugs. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta catch them early. You gotta check you everything. You can't love them all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Melissa, it, it is not so bad. It has been so wonderful to have you. If you don't mind advancing forward to the slide, I want to give folks um, just a way to connect back to us. I think there's some end slides. So we have fabulous resources on our website. One, the planting calendar. When do I plant this plant? Do I start it from seed? Does it need extra timing under lights? Um, so many resources I can help spell out. Um, those of us that are, are new to gardening or, or just need to get some more information on a certain topic. We also have the URI Gardening and Environmental Hotline. And folks, when I tell you this service is legit, it is so legit. And we operate year round and you get to connect with a human. So you take a picture of that insect in your garden, take a picture of that weed, of that potential plant disease and send that picture to gardener at uri.edu. And real people will research your question and they will talk to the experts at URI, answer it and get back to you as quickly as possible. So I really urge all of um, all of our people in our state, Rhode Islanders, to uh, tap into this service. And every Tuesday, if you haven't joined us before, we have uh, this free Learn at Home webinar series. I believe next week, I think we're jumping into um, all the awesome research that's happening at URI surrounding maple syrup. I am so excited for that one. And if you have just general questions, there's our phone number, there's our email address. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, we are there. Melissa, we are so lucky to have you and all of our master gardeners. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. I had a lot of fun too. Lastly, lastly, awesome plug for our 
URI Master Gardener program. We are only accepting applications for just a little bit longer. November 1st, we also have a home uh, horticulture certificate uh, program that might even already be full. Uh, we are going to be doing our class online. Uh, we have a lot in store. We're really excited as we go into our food systems focus. Uh, it's going to be great. So if you are someone that wants to learn more and share that with Rhode Islanders and beyond, uh, the URI Master Gardener program is for you. If you have questions on that, you can email us that as well. Melissa, have a great night. I hope um, you wake up to wonderful insects tomorrow on your on your adventures. And I can't wait to see what you teach for us next. Thank you for having me. Yay. All right. And if you want to see this recording, it'll be up in just a few more days. And thanks for all of you that are watching it afterwards. All right. Well, have a great night, everyone. All right. Good night. Good night.